It's over, Gaius. I have the high ground. Bitch, I am the high ground. Shadow of the Colossus is as good as you've heard it is. It's one of the most unique and interesting games I've ever played, and every gamer should experience it before they die. It's also a game that's very hard to pigeonhole into one specific genre. I mean, I guess it's like a puzzle game if the puzzle was trying to kill you. See, Shadow of the Colossus is really light on story, and there's plenty of room for people to theorize what's going on without the game assaulting you with how vague it is. <coughs> Unfortunately, this lack of story makes the opening cutscene feel even longer than it is. It consists of riding a horse down every stairs, statues, carrying a dead person to a table and uncovering the dead person to reveal it is a dead person, talking to the fucking ceiling like a crazy person. And HD Wander's creepy baby face. Why would you do this? Now, I appreciate that they're trying to build atmosphere, and hey, if you like this opening, then... You do new. But I've never really been a fan of long cutscenes at the beginning of games, especially when they're really light on story, like Shadow of the Colossus is. I mean, to sum it up, girl's dead, fight 16 bosses to bring her back. And it's no deal breaker, because afterwards, the game very cleverly teaches me how to play the game with a brief mountain climbing segment. I see what you did there. See, they use this to teach you the game mechanics in a non-hostile environment. And it's good that they do this early on. So you don't have to go to the boss fights being all like, What do I do? What do I do? That spiked. I I'm sure that spiked. In fact, let's talk about the controls for a minute, because they're actually incredibly intuitive, despite what you may have heard. Now, some people have an issue with how clumsily Wander moves. And yeah, he's always tripping all over himself and... I mean, you're seeing this run. See, he's got a lot of weight behind him, like someone who is climbing a 50-foot tall minotaur, but I feel like contextually speaking, that makes sense. The game makes use of a stamina gauge. You have to hold the shoulder button to hold onto the Colossus, which will drain your stamina. And having to exert that little bit of real-world energy to hold down R1 makes you kind of feel like you're actually holding on to a Colossus for dear life as it tries to shake you off. This is why I was so drawn to Wander as a character. You can kind of empathize with him because you feel like you're experiencing what's happening on screen with him because the controls feel almost realistic. Of course, maybe I'm just batshit insane. Yeah, okay, they're kind of awkward, but you know what else is awkward? Probably climbing a 50-foot minotaur. The game also benefits from a really well-paced learning curve. See, the first Colossus isn't really anything special. It's just there to give you a sense of the scale of the Colossi, and also to teach you a few basic mechanics, like hitting weak points and managing your stamina. It's the most straightforward, just climb and stab. Number two is also pretty basic, but it's the first one to make use of the bow, and it shows you that sometimes you'll have to bait the Colossus into attacking first. Another thing is it introduces the concept of multiple weak points, making you maneuver around the Colossus while it's moving and, uh... I love this game. Number three gets a little more complicated, making you use the environment to weaken it. You can't climb it without it hitting this metal disc thing that's there for some reason and cracking its armor. So you gotta do this little dance with it before you can make progress. Kind of expanding on what the game just taught you in the last boss. Number four teaches you that some of the Colossi are bullshit. And finally, you graduate to Colossus number five, which, in my opinion, encompasses everything great about Shadow of the Colossus. So at this point, you've beaten four bosses and you probably think you know what to expect. And then Avion here is like, Okay, so this feels kind of hopeless. Doesn't help that the soundtrack is mocking me. Alright, what am I supposed to do? Oh yeah, that's right! I guess I'll try and get his attention. Oh, wait. Oh, and we're flying! Yep, this is definitely happening. Let me just take a minute to break this down for you. Uh, you shoot him with an arrow, so he'll swoop down to your level, and you grab onto his wing as he soars upwards, taking you with him. I don't 
don't think you understand what I just said. See, see, this isn't some fancy pre-rendered cutscene or, or a fucking quick time event. This is all gameplay. This is actually happening to you. It's not like you shoot him and then long cutscene and then you're in the air next minute. No, no, no. This boss fight uses techniques that you learned while playing the game. Timing when to hit the grab button to grab onto his wing mid-air and then stabbing him and watching him crash into the sea and slowly discovering that you in fact may be the real monster for killing something so majestic. That's all you! Please tell me I'm a good person. Like with previous bosses, you have to manage your stamina and maneuver the Colossus. But but this time you're mid- no, no, seriously, you don't get it. You're in mid-air! Oh my god, it's so fucking awesome! <sighs> and then the uh, strategy for the sixth one is... Run away! Run away! Run away! Fighting the Colossi is really only half the game, though. You also have to find them, which consists of riding a horse through an empty, barren wasteland with no music. Okay, I joke, but I actually do appreciate these interludes. They could have had creepy ceiling voice man just transport you magically to each colossus, like, but actually having to find them builds up anticipation for the next one naturally. You feel like you're actually going out to hunt them as opposed to just having them line up for you. The devs put a lot of effort into making the overworld feel empty. I know that sounds like a backhanded compliment, but there's so much detail in places that you really don't even have to bother going to. It makes the world seem like an actual abandoned wasteland. Plus, if you get bored, you can just like roleplay or something. Go back, aggro! I'm going to Mordor alone! <laughs> so I think everyone who plays this game has that one colossus that they just can't stand. And for me, it's number 12. You know what's fun? Slowly agonizingly swimming to the back of a giant monster man to get behind him. What? That's not arbitrary enough for you? Well, how about climbing to the top of his head to find no weak point, but a set of teeth that are there for reasons, and hitting a specific set of them to guide him towards a shrine where you jump off and then for no discernible reason, he decides to lift up his arms on the thing, exposing his weak point, and then you stab him in the chest. Sounds boring? Don't worry, you do it twice. This isn't a boss. This is a Mad Lib. The worst part is that he comes right before a fan favorite Colossus. Look at that majestic bastard. Time to die! The only other boss I don't really like is number 14. Besides being a reskin of Ozai here, who already is not exactly colossal, this boss is just repetitive. Rain arrows down on him until he decides it hurts, and then make him knock over the pillar. This happens like eight times. Am I doing good? Where are you going with this? Just as planned? Why are you the way that you are? Okay, so fair warning, I'm not going to spoil the very end of this game, but I am going to talk about the final boss and uh, some crucial plot details. So if you don't want the experience ruined for you, I would stop here. Okay, so a lot of people take issue with the final boss, and I kind of get why. At face value, it just feels like you're running through a linear obstacle course to reach him. Climbing him is sort of underwhelming too, because he doesn't really put up much of a fight. He just kind of wobbles a little bit. Oh no, that's mildly inconvenient. And then sometimes this happens. They ask you how you are, and you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine, but you just can't get into it because they would never understand. Here's the way I experienced it though. The game never romanticized slaying the Colossi, they were just living creatures that inhabited the land. And I didn't think too much about this until...
See, now your whole crusade has led to the loss of Agro, your only companion. Someone whose entire role in the game is just to blindly be loyal to you even if what you're doing is wrong. She didn't know any better. And now, you're truly alone. And this is actually emphasized really well by a short segment in which you have to reach the Colossus on your own for the first time. See, I don't think it would have made much sense to go from this to... RULES OF NATURE! Honestly, this felt like the only way the game could end. At the end of the day, you're kind of just killing an innocent animal. I think that's what makes Shadow of the Colossus such an amazing game. It deconstructs the monster slaying power fantasy that most games give you by just making you a normal person. Wander is clumsy, he trips over himself, and yeah, you're seeing that run. He's motivated by selfish and yet human goals, and the Colossi are really just means to an end. They're innocent victims swept up in all this. Except for Dirge. I killed that freak and felt absolutely nothing.